And you see, what we're dealing with here and what we're talking about is gang stalking. And with gang stalking, uh, it's a community-based effort. Remember, the gloves didn't fit, right? Well, those gloves sort of remind me of all the anomalies in this case, like the truck that circles around, you know, the truck that we can't seem to see who it is and what and the white car, the white car that pulls in and turns around and 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 backs out. Hey, guys, Freedom Voice here. I want to go with part three of the video. Micah Miller was gang stalked. And specifically in this video, I want to focus on the gas station, 41 Grocery and Grill. The reason why I'm doing these videos once again is justice for Micah. I want to go back to really quickly the, uh, the pawn shop and emphasize the fact that it was Micah that felt like she was being stalked. She felt like she was being followed. And indeed, she was being tracked. Uh, it's in the police report. And it was actually stated by her family that they did find the trackers. So this is, this is a known fact. And we can actually see it in the video. Uh, a lot of the conclusions that I've come to is as a result of watching the actions of Micah in the videos. Specifically, when she saw the guy in the green shirt here. Uh, it was the guy in the green shirt that really raised the eyebrow. And I got a lot of comments on my last video, uh, basically asking, how did I know that he was actually stalking her once he went through the doors? Well, before I actually put that video out, I took a good hard look at the video. And one of the things I noticed was that if you'll notice here, the guy in the green shirt, he has his hands behind his back. Now, when you look at the video uh, that I posted, you look up at the timestamp, you can see him actually bending over if you look really good here. And I don't know if your computer is large enough, your screen is large enough to see it, but you can see him walking toward the window. And the interesting thing about it is he's in the same position with his arms behind his back. If you look really close at 1234 and 20 seconds, you can see his arms behind his back. You can see him clearly walking up to the window. Now I'm going to zoom even closer. You can see him sort of bending over. You can see the arms behind the back. Just like he was when he before he walked into the jury mark. So uh, this was the conclusion that I sort of arrived at as a result of watching the video. Then when you put it side by side, and I synchronized it perfectly, when you put it side by side, as he's walking up to the vi window, that's exactly around the time when Micah was backing out. I mean, you can look at the video yourself and you'll see uh, the timestamps are, are accurate. So the question is, was she being stalked? Was she being followed? Well, even the news covered it, and they actually mentioned it. Uh, I think it was about a week ago. In the news, uh, it re reported South Carolina pastor John Paul Miller's late wife allegedly claimed someone was stalking her. And it, on the website, it says, additionally, the friend said that Micah said she was being stalked. She said that someone cut her tires and she found trackers on her car. They wrote she had her tires cut multiple times, found multiple trackers on her car, couch hopped in fear of being found and was hospitalized by her husband when it was completely unnecessary. She confided to me that she felt like an orphan and feared that no church would want her because of him. All right, that brings me to this portion at the Lumber River State Park, the report of the fisherman and what he said he found. I want to go ahead and play Here's that video. The, uh, the, the park, of course. This is where I put my boat in at. Along, you see how thick the woods are? That's why come I couldn't see nothing. So right along in here is where I found Micah's belongings at. It was then published in Newsweek that the fisherman found Micah's fanny pack, which included her driver's license, bank card, keys, and $500 in cash. Now, what's interesting is what they quote the fisherman saying down at the bottom. I don't know why I grabbed it. I just grabbed it. I didn't ever look at it or nothing. Now, 
that brings up this question. Where did the $500 come from? Could it possibly have come from someone that I call the kind-hearted family friend? Was it actually part of more money that was used perhaps for expenses like car registration, car payment? And maybe the $500 was also used for or to be used for purchasing the SIG-9, the firearm. It's interesting that the firearm does actually cost $500. Maybe it was the kind-hearted family friend that knew exactly where to get the best deal. And so he made the suggestion to get it from the pawn shop. You know, a lot of these things we don't know the answer to, but I think there's a reason why a lot of things happen the way they happen. And I'm sort of asking questions. That's all. Why did she, in fact, buy a firearm? Why did she drive to the gas station? And why did she wait at the gas station? and then go to Lumber River State Park. Could it be that they were planning to meet somewhere close by for target practice? Could it be that the kind-hearted family friend was so kind-hearted that he actually agreed to meet her at 41 Grocery and Grill and then drive from there to the Lumber River State Park or maybe somewhere close by the Lumber River State Park? Could it be that the kind-hearted family friend actually has property near the Lumber River State Park? And so for that reason, he knew the area, he knew how to get there, and he was planning to meet her at the gas station to drive her from there. You know, these are questions that obviously we don't have answers to, but I think it's very interesting as we look at the details and the facts. So that brings me to this Uh, this clip here where we find Micah driving through the carport at the gas station. Now, the question I ask is, why did she pull through the carport? If, in fact, she needed gas, why didn't she just pull up to the gas pumps and start pumping? I know why I would pull out in the open like that, especially if I were going to meet someone and follow them to another location. I mean, obviously, you want them to see that you're there if they're not there yet. And then also, you don't want to block the pumps so that others can't drive in and get fuel. And then the other question that I had, something that I think really deserves an answer is, why go inside just for drink and not pay for your gas and drink at the same time? Because if you remember, when she came outside, She went to the porta potty and then she drove and made a U-turn and went right up to the pump and went back inside, paid for fuel, and then came out and started pumping. So why not do it all at once? See, a lot of these details leads me to believe that she was planning to meet someone here. The same someone that I believe suggests that she go and buy the firearm, suggests what type, suggest where to meet, advised on the type of firearm, and even maybe perhaps gifted her with enough money to be able to buy the firearm, pay expenses, pay for fuel, and everything else. Now, again, I know this may sound speculative because we don't know, but I'm just asking questions because of the details of what I'm seeing in the videos. Maybe while she was inside, maybe she got a text perhaps, which stated from the kind-hearted family friend, I'm at the Lumber River Park, just drive here. And maybe she texted back and said, I don't know where to come. And maybe he replied and said, just Google it. It's the only state park near you. You have to realize that this whole thing is a plot. And so whoever's plotting to... If, if, in fact, they're plotting to unalive her and make it look like she did it, they had to have a plan. And then the truck drives up, you know. The truck driving up is much like the people that came into the pawn shop. It's kind of like the anomaly that you really don't know for sure, but it just seems out of the ordinary, especially when he makes the U-turn and then he goes back the direction that he came. 
if you look at the overhead view, all of these roads connect, but they're they're not close. They're very far. In fact, when I show you the overhead, you can see all the blue lines here. Uh, this represents roads that connect. So it's very easy to circle around and, and come another direction. You see, a lot of people want to see kind of like in the case of uh, someone who's being stalked, they want to kind of see evidence of the same car or the same individual or the same. And you see what we're dealing with here and what we're talking about is gang stalking. And with gang stalking, uh, it's a community based effort. It's community and more than one person. And, uh, and the reason why they have more than one person and they do it sort of in a communal setting is to increase plausible deniability. Plausible deniability says it's easy to deny the fact that something is taking place, like in the, in the event of a crime. Uh, it's easy to deny it. You can see the white car pulls up in front of her and then stops. And what's interesting is she pulls out and she actually pulls up and stops as well. Um, and she stops again the second time. I'm wondering if she's not actually watching that white car. We don't know. Obviously, I don't know. But ultimately, she circles around and she comes up to the pump and she pumps her fuel. Now, again, these are all questions that I'm asking because obviously we don't have an answer. I'm sure that there is a logical answer, but I don't think the answer is what they would have us believe, that, you know, she's didn't take her meds and maybe she's depressed and she's getting ready to go unalive herself. Everything that I'm looking at in this video suggests the fact that she was very conscientious, not only of her surroundings, because she felt stalked, she felt followed. You got to keep in mind, guys, that she possibly has a tracker on the car even now. And who put the tracker on there? The man, the man that stands up on Sunday morning and speaks to people. You know the man I'm talking about. The man that claims that he's going to sue the entire Internet for defamation of character. Yeah, that man. You know, the man that says he has 350 items of proof. Uh, the man that everyone's afraid of. The man that doesn't mind criticizing his wife publicly. The man that says he has demons coming out of him. Yeah, that man. And maybe, in fact, the kind-hearted family friend actually works for that man. Maybe they're best friends. I don't know. I'm just throwing this out there, guys. I'm not suggesting anything, and everything in this video is alleged. I am just trying to answer questions that I've had after looking at these videos. So even though we don't have answers... I do believe that there is an answer, and I don't believe the answer is the official report that we've been told. Now, obviously, we will never know. But one thing we know for sure, and one thing I tried to emphasize in these videos over and over and over again, is Micah felt stalked, she felt uh, uh, followed, harassed, and unsafe. So much so that she went and purchased a firearm. And then she drove to a remote location. And I don't believe she drove there because she just couldn't find anywhere else. If she wanted to unalive herself, she couldn't find anywhere else in South Carolina. She had to drive all the way north in order to do it. It just doesn't make sense, guys. It doesn't make sense. There are more questions as it relates to this case than answers. There are more strange anomalies as I think about this whole entire case, then I can answer. But, you know, a lot of these things and a lot of these points that I'm bringing out in this video is simply because I'm sure there's an answer. I'm sure there's a logical answer. I just don't believe the answer that we've been told. One thing is for sure, though. I know that God knows. And I know that God is going to deal with the parties involved in this case because it was not just, and justice is going to be served. You know, this reminds me of 
the Nicole Brown Simpson case. You remember the Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman? You remember she was the victim of a crime, right? Well, do you remember her husband, O.J. Simpson, when he was asked to put the gloves on? You remember the gloves didn't fit, right? Well, those gloves sort of remind me of all the anomalies in this case, like the truck that circles around, you know, the truck that we can't seem to see who it is, and what, and the white car, the white car that pulls in and turns around and 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 backs out, or or pulls in front of her and stops. You know, these anomalies that we see uh, over and over and over again in all the videos. I think there's a very clear reason why over and over Micah stated the fact that she had been stalked. Uh, there's a reason why the trackers were put on her car. Because you see, the trackers would allow, it would make it easy for a lot of these cars and a lot of these people to know exactly where she is at all times especially if it's a heavy-duty tracker that tracks from the satellites in space. So again, the gloves, in the case of O.J. Simpson or Nicole Brown Simpson, yeah, they represent all of these anomalies, strange anomalies that we can't answer. And even though the gloves didn't fit the mastermind, the gloves were definitely part of the crime. And the gloves actually just served to sort of camouflage all the abuse that Nicole Brown Simpson went through. Micah Miller has been stating over and over and over that she felt she was being stalked. She had trackers put on her car. She, obviously, she went through terrible emotional and mental abuse. Well, a lot of times emotional and mental abuse is not readily seen on the surface. In fact, a lot of victims suffer in silence, and they have a tendency to hide it under smiles for many years. Emotional and mental abuse is actually more damaging than physical abuse. Unlike in the case of Nicole Brown Simpson, where she endured terrible physical abuse, Micah Miller has made it clear that she was under heavy emotional and mental abuse. And these are things that can't go unnoticed as we look at this case. Because I don't think it was so bad for her that she went somewhere and unalived herself. But rather, I believe that she was in so many ways looking for help, looking for support, but she didn't find it. So I hope one day that we find answers to all of these questions. And I do believe that God knows the answer. So until next time, guys, like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one.